And we are back for another episode of the Productivity Show. Today, I am joined by my good friend, Sajid Gupta. How are you today, buddy? I am doing well. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited to uh, chat with you today because I know you're a philosopher, a big thinker, and you have a different way of being productive. But before we start diving into today, today's content, one of the things we always like to ask our guests is some of their favorite productivity resources as of lately. So in 90 seconds or less, would you sh mind sharing some of your favorites? Yes, I'll share three. Um, so first is the five minute journal. Uh, one of the things that's been really helpful for me in terms of being productive is training myself to be positive some and, and feeling gratitude for things that are already going off. Because if we're all like eight players, it's very like small times when we take the time to just like reflect on what's happened. So the first is the five minute journal. The second is I read this quote the, earlier this year, which was procrastination is more of an emotional regulation problem than a time management problem. Because so many times we like try and fix it with like more schedules or more planning and like it never works, right? If we're like procrastinating on something. And it's been super helpful to go and understand the emotion behind it. So it was this book actually, Emotional Intelligence by Charles M. Jones that kind of like breaks down if you're feeling certain things, like what it actually means. And it, it like, it helped me unlock a different level of productivity. And the third is something we did together is this, um, especially now that we're also connected, is the power of time off. So three months ago, we took like a weekend off, went to the woods in Austin and just relaxed. And I think most people don't do that. So just tr forcing myself to every week, even take like three hours to six hours without technology and just reflect on the week and plan for the next week. So those are the three sort of, um, it, it, some of them are tactical, some of them are more like philosophical, but they've helped me unlock like different levels of just being productive. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for sharing those things. And uh, for those who are listening, we'll make sure to add the links in the show notes. So don't worry if you missed anything. Uh, Sajid, for those who don't know who you are, and obviously I know you for a long time now, but for those who don't know who you are, uh, would you mind kind of sharing your story and what you're up to? Yeah, um, I've basically spent the last decade um, trying to sort of like understand this concept of like, how do you make a life through your art without selling your soul? And it's taken a lot of different forms. Um, eight years ago, I was starting out and was ju just basically really inspired by all of these podcasters that I listened to. So I emailed about hundreds of companies and podcasters and basically was like, hey, um, I'm right out of college. I want to work with you. I'll offer to work with you for free if you give me a shot. That's how I started working with a podcaster named Andrew Warner of Mixergy and did really well for him. And then within the next three years, uh, ended up working with some of the top podcasters in the industry, Tim Ferriss, Seth Godin. And it was just really great experience being on the business and, and growth side for a lot of creators I was inspired by. And then last uh, December, uh, started my own show called Conscious Creator Show to like explore this topic more further. And more recently joined um, with this company called OnDeck to create a fellowship for other podcasters. So really like the, the common thread that like ties everything has been one, this fascination with like people I call creators, whether like artists, podcasters, and then being sort of like in that role of supporting them um, and helping them achieve their dreams. You know, you and I have had many conversations late at night over a few drinks every now and then to like trying to figure out like, what do we do with our lives? And I know a lot of people are listening are always trying to figure out like, you know, if they're unhappy with their jobs or they're not quite sure where they are in life. Like you and I have had many conversations about that. Like, how did you kind of figure that out for yourself? Like, this is the thing I want to do. Yeah. And I think this is actually, it ties in with like probably my number one productivity tip for people is asking yourselves this question of like, what am I actually working on? What is the game I'm playing? Because if what you're working on or the game you're playing is not the one you wanna be playing, even if you're at like max Asian efficiency, it doesn't matter, right? Because you're working on the wrong thing. Um, so a few things I do to, to sort of like make sure I'm on the right track is one is this exercise where I basically try and project three years or five years down the line of what I'm doing and what that looks like. Um, whether it's looking at other people in those roles, whether it's just really like closing your eyes and imagining um, what that would feel like and asking my myself the question, is that what I wanna be doing? So for example, right out of college, I was working at GE Capital. And I remember there was this person sitting in front of, in, in sort of like front of me who'd been there for 10, 20 years. And I looked at that and asked myself that question without any judgment of like, 
is this what I want to be doing in like five or 10 years? And the answer was no. And that's when I knew, um, like I had to leave right away. Um, in, in terms of like what I'm doing now, what I do is like, I'll imagine sort of like what that looks like um, in three years. And then just like ask this question is like, does that feel expansive? Like I, I want to keep doing it or does it feel like constrictive, right? Cause like sometimes let's say you're in a job and you're on the track to become a manager. But if you like stop yourself and ask like, do I actually want to be a manager? Do I want to manage like tens of or hundreds of people instead of like doing the thing that I'm passionate about? That actually might not be what you want. Um, so just going back and asking this question, is this what I want to be working on? Is this the game I want to be playing? Yeah, this is something I was always uh, very fortunate in because when Asian efficiency started, it started off as a passion project. It wasn't meant to be a business. It was never meant to make money. And I was just committed to blogging every single week, writing about productivity. And as I was learning about productivity and time management and efficiency, and it just accidentally turned into a business. And I'm very fortunate to be able to do something that in your words kind of feels expansive over time. Right. And like, I was passionate about productivity. I was really passionate about business and then being able to manage both of them to do them at the same time. And then expanding from there, you know, very fortunate in that sense. But I know for a lot of people, that's not always the case. I, I like the idea of just asking yourself those questions, but also looking at people who are further ahead of you and seeing like, is this actually something I want to go on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one thing I'm curious about is when, when, you, when you were like in those days of just like writing every day and blogging every day, um, how long did it take for you to like start seeing some success? Mm, I think... I was blogging for about six months consistently for the first, mm -hmm. like every first six months, every single week I was posting something. And about around that time, that's when people started reaching out and saying, Hey, I love your content. I love your ideas. Um, and maybe like a year later, a year and a half or so, that's when the decision came to turn it into a business because it was just overwhelming demand for more for like, you know, private consulting, coaching consultations um and you know it's kind of the idea sometimes i mean i don't always agree with this idea of like follow your passion necessarily mm -hmm. because i think you can become passionate about something that you know didn't start off as a passion right um and i was just really committed to the idea of like showing up every single week posting and whatever comes out of it comes out of it but at least i did i did the work mm -hmm. yeah and i think one is like doing the work is so important but the second thing is the, what you mentioned, which is I've studied a lot of like creators, like YouTubers or people who podcast and all. And barring a few exceptions, I've always seen that success usually takes like two, three years or like comes down the line, right? Um, like you'll, you'll be like publishing YouTube videos for like three years before you hit maybe your first like thousand, 2000 subscribers. And then, then it takes off because that's the time you need to sort of like find your edge. So this is sort of like another rule I try and follow is if I'm starting to do something or starting to do a new project, especially now, like everyone's sort of like at home and working on like projects they're passionate about. Um, I'll first set, give myself a very like short-term timeline to see if I like doing it. So when I started podcasting, I was, it was like, I'll do it for three months. And then if I like it, um, I can keep doing it. And if I don't like it, I can just stop. And like, that's completely okay. And so, so first I give myself a very short timeline. And then I start to look at it from a very like long-term timeline and horizon. Um, because most benefits of things like this come from co compound, compounding four or five years down the line. So then asking yourself this question, do I see myself doing the same thing for four or five years? Because if not, like, you're not going to get most of the benefits out of it. So what would be a short time for you? Is that like 30 days, one week, 90 days? Like, what does that mean to you? So, so I think positive, um, the, the podcast is a great example of that. I basically gave myself three months where I was like, I'll record and I'll, publish for three months and see if I like it. And if I don't, I can go back to like being the behind the scenes person. Don't you have to keep podcasting? And like very quickly within the first two, three weeks, I was like, okay, this is something I want to keep doing. And that's why I like actually took a little break to like now, like put in the systems and plans in place so that I can keep doing it. Like not just a year, but like for five, 10 years down the line, because it's something I really enjoy. Yeah. And I think one thing that you have as a trait more than I do. And I definitely don't have this trait whatsoever, but I know a lot of people do, and I, including you, is I think you definitely have more of a perfectionist trade than I have, right? And I remember when we did our digital detox, we're having these conversations and you said, 
man, I've recorded all these podcasts, but I'm not happy with them whatsoever. I just didn't feel the energy or it wasn't up to the standard I would like it to be. So I'm going to scrap all of those and do them all over again or start something brand new. And uh, I think that's something that's really powerful, but can also sometimes hold us back because then we start to like focus in on something that maybe is like, you know, from my point of view, like, like maybe gives you like a little edge, whereas like there's all these big rocks that need to be moved that I think are much more productive. So how do you manage that? Yeah, there, there's this huge balance um, when, when you're sort of like in, in that like creator space of just trying to improve, improve, improve. But then there's also sort of the uh, the business side of like, okay, like we need to move forward. Um, I won't even actually use the statement that I manage it because I think I'm still learning. Uh, like, for example, like I've talked to a lot of entrepreneurs and I'll ask them like, how do you like do work-life balance? And like, barring a few exceptions, what I've seen is like, everyone is still like figuring it out and working at, working at it. So I think like, the first thing is just establishing, I don't have it figured out, like I'm still working on it. Um, the things that have been helpful for me in that balance um, more recently has been creating some sort of social accountability. Um, so for example, when I started the podcast, I remember I met a friend for dinner or, or lunch and we were like, okay, we both will start a podcast and publish by this day. So it was okay, like during this period, I can be the perfectionist, I can keep improving. But at this point, this needs to be put out, right? And then like, let's say like you're working on a team, like promising your team, okay, I'm working on this and we're going to publish on this day. And then these are all of the other things that will happen from it. So the thing actually that's helped me most to not go into that like creative hole is just creating social accountability um, to publish something publicly. Yeah, I think that's something uh, is so underutilized because one of the things we always teach inside of our courses and in our podcast as well is just, when you can add accountability on top of your goals, the chances of you succeeding goes up tremendously, right? And so anytime I set a personal goal now, I always try to find some form of accountability as well. So you mentioned like you use social ones. Uh, my preferred method personally is like having a coach or a person that I have to report back to and say, hey, uh, like I have a personal trainer and the, you know, that's a form of accountability because I have to show up and you, you and I have worked with the same one, Bert, as you know. And uh, I actually need to get him on the podcast at some point to talk about feet productivity because <laughs> he uh, does a lot of foot strength and all that stuff, which is very interesting and blew my mind. Uh, but that's a different story. And uh, yeah, so anytime I set goals, I always try to figure out, okay, yes, we want to add a reward to a goal because I think that's useful as well and because it really motivates me. But also if we add a form of accountability, the chances of success goes up tremendously. So you have all these different components to like goal setting and just achievement. And if we just put the basics in place, like our chances of success goes up tremendously. And I think mm -hmm. uh, the way you recognize that for yourself was to have some sort of social accountability. Yeah, one thing that you mentioned, I'm actually curious like how this applies to you for business. One of the benefits of like working with like a coach or hiring someone is to improve out of that thing they'll do the learning for you and then they can bring that to like however they're coaching you right like because like the amount of time Bert is spending reading like fitness stuff there's no way I'm going to do that or you're going to do that um so one thing I'm curious about for, for you is like when you look at your business how do you decide whether it, like some like there's like a let's say like a job to be done or a task you want to go attack it yourself because you like like the creative part of it or you'd rather hire someone and then just have them do it and like pay for it um, I'm definitely leaning always on the side of delegation rather than doing things mm -hmm. myself. And so to me, it's kind of the idea of if I'm going to do it myself, it has to be very energy giving, meaning I'm really excited about it. Like this is something I want to do. I want to take ownership, ownership of this. This is going to be my little project or my little thing. If I don't get that kind of energy or feeling, then I would rather delegate it and have someone else mm -hmm. do it. And ideally find someone even in my team that is really passionate about that or wants to learn about that. So it's kind of a win-win for everyone, right? And if it's nobody mm -hmm. on the team that wants to do that, then I would give it outside of our company and just find someone and pay them. Assuming there's some sort of ROI or it makes monetary sense, right? Because I think as a business owner, anytime you delegate something outside of your company or even within your company, but especially mm -hmm. outside the company, you have to exchange money for results, right? And those results have to be worth the money, 
And so that's something I was trying to think of too. It's like, like if I'm delegating this to someone else and I'm paying, let's say a thousand dollars, like, can I realistically make that back like in multiple forms or multiple spades? Right. And if I can't see that or that cycle is way too long. So for example, if I'm investing a thousand dollars, but it might take like 10 months to get it back. Am I willing to make that trade off? And sometimes yes. And sometimes no, it just depends on the horizon as well. Yeah, so you're looking at the horizon of like wh where the ROI will come from and like if that is worth it. Yeah, so like I'm a big fan of scaling up, right? And one of the things that they, mm -hmm. they talk about is the cash cycle. So like you have cash in your hands and you put it in somewhere, right? Let's say you put in a dollar into a machine and the machine start working, but then eventually the machine starts spitting out something too. And hopefully it's more than a dollar that you didn't get back, right? But then mm -hmm. ideally it's, one, more than a dollar, but two, how fast is that cycle or how short is that cycle? The shorter the cycle, the better for you because then you can reinvest the profits and, and so on. But if the cycle is really long, then the payoff better be really high. Mm -hmm. And so I like to think of it as that way. And so, you know, every dollar has its own job, right? That's, a, that's kind of like a personal finance mantra. And so it's the same thing in business or whenever I'm delegating something, like what's the cycle, what's the payoff and... Um, if I'm doing it myself, I'll, part of it is for me is just like the learning aspect of it. I want to learn something, but also like what's the payoff as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's one thing I've, I've actually learned about myself is like, I love doing the zero to one of something and then very quickly get bored. So for example, like when, when you were talking about the podcast thing, um, and, th and this is where I was actually like, I'm considering like, do I actually go in and learn this or do I find someone I've now become fascinated about like how you take a podcast and edit it to like make it go from like good to like great right and i was like okay do i like go into the audio tools and like start learning all, all the audio tools before i hire someone to like understand the framework and like so i can speak better about what i want and i think in this there is a subtext of like um i actually believe self-awareness is the ultimate productivity hack it's just like knowing who you are so like i know for example i'll take something do zero to one and then like if i don't bring in someone to like run it that system's not going to work. Um, and then there's people who are like so much better at like, just like the one to five and, and, and learning that. Yeah. I would say you and I are opposites in that sense. Like I don't like to go from zero to one. I don't like to do the grind or the startup work or doing all the research. I'm not personally a huge fan of that. I, uh, even when people, you know, delegate tasks to me, I I'm the guy who is great at, okay, you already did all the startup work. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me finish it. Let me close it. Let me just put the finishing, finishing details and, you know, take it to another level. And uh, one interesting question I always ask people is, you know, if the internet didn't exist, what kind of work would you be doing? And when I asked myself that question, I would likely be a management consultant. So someone who comes into an existing company, looks at all the processes that are going on, finds all the inefficiency and leaks and Looks, looks at the big picture and says, okay, here are all the things that are inefficient. So if we just fix these things, then your output would be like two, three, four, five X, right? And so like, it's already there. I didn't have to build it. Like it's already there. I just have to tweak it and maximize it. And that's like my specialty, I would say. Whereas yours is sounds like more like building the machine, making it. And then once the machine is there, have someone else take care of the rest. Yeah, like more of the creative side. And what's interesting about what you said is, you're essentially doing what you said, like you'd be doing as a management consultant, but instead of doing it, you're teaching it. And through the internet, you're teaching it at scale. And that's really cool. Yeah, yeah. So um, as you're creating stuff now, Sachi, like what does a typical day now look like for you? Like, I'm kind of curious, like how other people, you know, set up their day, their rituals, their routines, because I'm always fascinated as well, like how other people start their day. Cause I'm a big believer personally of like the way you start your day sets the tone for the rest of the day. But I know a lot of people don't always agree with that. So what, what does your typical day look like as soon as you wake up to like going to bed? Yeah. Um, typically um, it, it, on the most productive days, there's a set of few things and I'm trying to like write hit right in the morning um, meditation, doing some sort of journaling, doing some sort of workout. Um, what I'm really enjoying with that right now recently has been, I bought this thing for $30 on Amazon. It's like a, it's called a grip. And then you just put it on a dumbbell and you have a kettlebell. So I just do like swings in the morning tea. And then I just like get into work. Um, I've been skipping breakfast and just like eating around like 11 or 12. And that's been super helpful. Um, the, the other thing I will say though, too, is like 
that's on an ideal day, right? And it's like definitely not hitting it um, 100%, maybe like 60, 70% of the time. And the, the one that I would say is the most important is meditation in that. And I'm going to take a pause here. What was the other question? Sorry. Uh, what, what do you do on a typical day? All right. Okay. Yeah. The, the other thing, um, I, I, have you read uh, Paul Graham's essay on like the makers versus manager schedule? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But for those so, who don't so, know what that is, could you quickly explain? Yes. So, so the maker schedule is basically, um, he talks about how there's two kinds of like schedules you can have where if you're more in a creative field, like software development or something creative, you, what you want to have is a maker schedule where you have long and uninterrupted blocks of time to just create, do creative work. Manager schedule is like, if you're more of a product manager or you're managing your team, your schedule is broken up in like increments of like just 30 minutes or 60 minutes where people can set meetings. And what happens there is um, if you're, let's say like have like five meetings in a day that are 30 minutes in a break, 30 minutes in a break, it's really hard to get into anything creative because there's so much context switching happening. So for me, um, I sort of like float between those two. Um, earlier this year when I was only focusing on my podcast, I wasn't like complete like maker schedule. Like didn't have, remember have, having a few months where I basically had like two or three calls a week. So there my schedule was more, I'd like wake up, do all the things that I mentioned, eat a breakfast, go for like a long walk and then like slowly get into creative work. And what I was trying to do is like, just have some sort of output every day. Like for example, like writers, they'll just try and write like thousand or like 5,000 or 10,000 words a day. Just have a number that they have to hit. So you're, you're being consistent. Currently I'm more in a manager schedule. So it's, I wake up, um, do all those things, then get in, in a lot of calls. And then basically right now by like 3 PM, that's five PST and then eight Eastern in like Hawaii time. So calls are done. Then I'll go for a walk, come back just like two to five hours a day for just creative work. It's super, super important for me. Sorry, I just lost you for a second there. Oh man. Could you, could you repeat? Um, Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, I hear you now. Could you just repeat the last section that you said, like the 8 p.m. New York from there? Yeah, sorry about that, by the way, about the internet thing. I don't know what's happening. Uh, I'm going to call them after um yes so so and, and i think a lot of it is like influenced by where i am so like currently i'm in hst so at basically like 3 p.m it's 5 p.m pacific and 8 p.m eastern so now my calendar is like more geared towards that where basically 9 to about 3 p.m here is like calls so i'll just do calls and then i end that go for a long walk come back take a shower eat dinner and then just get into creative work um i'm also more of a night owl so when i'm in like regular like est hours I, I was being productive from like 10 PM to like 2 AM, like that sort of like nighttime. Yeah. Do you find yourself that certain seasons also make you more productive or focused? Like for example, I am way less productive in the summer, but I'm way more productive during the colder months of the year, just because there's like less going on. And like, that's the kind of season that I'm into. Uh, but also from a global point of view, I think there's certain years I'm way more focused on work. And the other years I'm less focused on work. Like, do you find that to be true too? I hadn't thought of that until you mentioned it, but definitely. Um, Cause around like sometimes like probably like December to March is whenever I'm like, like with like the new year, like thinking of like starting new projects. And whenever I'm starting a new project, I'm like really like diving into that. Um, and I agree with the fact that like, yeah, we all have these like sort of like seasons, right? Um, I, I think it's really interesting when I was 10 years ago, when I was starting out, I would read all these productivity books and like try and like basically like be like a robot. Um, but we're not like we're humans and we have seasons and we have highs and lows and dips and stuff. And, and I think through those cycles, we basically try and create as much as we can. So when it comes to um, your like schedule right now, you're mentioning you're kind of like on a manager schedule. Um, how do you how do you make that conscious decision? Is that something you do consciously to say, Hey, right now I'm in a phase where I'm going to make a manager schedule, or is that something just that, that just naturally happens? It's a combination of yes. Like a conscious choice of like, this is what this thing requires. And it goes back to that question of like, what game am I playing and what does that require? Um, so for example, um, 
Mark Andreessen, who was the founder of A16Z, um, actually has also talked about the same thing where he wrote this post on like productivity back in the day, like I think like 10 years ago, where he was talking about just how his schedule was completely like uninterrupted, like no calls and stuff. And then he recently wrote an article where he was like, it's completely flipped now, like every basically like 30 minute segment that he has planned is because he's doing like board meetings and VC meetings. Um, and so for me, it, it just depends on what I'm working on and knowing um, what sort of output and calendar that requires. Um, so for example, right now I'm like building this fellowship, which means talking to a lot of people to fill the first cohort. Um, let's say I want hundred people in the first cohort and I know it's gonna be a 25% conversion, right? Let's say just as an example, that means I have to talk to 400 people. 400 people over like X number of days will mean like these many calls a day. So just sort of like working backwards from what you're doing to know what that requires. Yeah, I think that's really, really good because when I think about my personal life, you know, my life is changing and evolving. And as a result, my schedule, which is kind of a reflection of my life changes as well, right? So in the early stages of Asian efficiency, it was very much building stuff, producing stuff, creating stuff. So there was a lot of deep work involved and un uninterrupted time to do things. And as Asian efficiency is evolving, it's a lot more connecting with other like-minded people, other business owners, uh, talking to a lot of customers and clients, kind of getting a pulse of what's going on in the industry, in the marketplace, and, and so on. And so it's a much more manager schedule for me now, less of a maker schedule. And that's just the season of life I'm in, right? And so whenever we hear productivity advice of like, hey, you need to do four hours of deep work every single day. I mean, there's a lot of value to that, but you also have to contextualize it as well. Like if you're someone who is in board meetings all day or is in client meetings all day, like that might not be true for you. So you kind of have to contextualize that. Yeah, every advice, every piece of advice is 100% right in the right context. But if the context doesn't match, you shouldn't be listening to that advice. Oh, I like that. That's a, that's a note or downer for, uh, for us here. <laughs> uh, before we started recording, one of the things you mentioned is that you have like personal rules around productivity, uh, which I think is an interesting topic here. So would you mind kind of sharing like what some of your personal rules are around productivity? Yeah, I, I was, I was like, before we started recording, I was thinking of like things that are like, not like tactical, like write like three things or whatever, but like more like sort of like philosophical questions. So the first one was as asking yourself, like, what am I working on? Um, second one, and I'm curious to like, even like hear your experience with this. I think this is another one of those like secret productivity things that like most people don't think about is learning how to say no. And then um, sort of like following the GTD thing um, of like do delegate delete and just focus on delete, looking at everything I'm doing and like asking myself, why am I doing this? Is this important? And if not, like just removing it. Because I think for, for all of us, or at least for me, my there's a section of my like to-do list that's just things that I've been like moving that are like half-finished projects that I kind of like committed to, but like not really, and like want to do, but don't want to do. And like just drawing really hard boundaries around saying no to them um, has personally for me been like a, a big game changer in, in, in freeing up time to focus on other things. Yeah, I think for me personally, a major, I wouldn't call it a rule, but kind of like a philosophy is um, I definitely want to say no more often than yes. And that's when it comes to, you know, planning to building something, uh, not being committed to too many different things leads to better focus in my experience. So like, Another way of saying this is if I'm over committed to many different things, I can't be really good at the things that I am focusing on. Right. And so I, for example, have like tons of business ideas and project ideas, but we can only do one thing at a time. And we mm -hmm. really want to be focusing on that. So for example, I know we've wanted to launch a planner, right. Or um, like a calendar. We wanted to launch a conference, um, for many years, I resisted the idea of launching a podcast until the time was right. And one, once the time was right, you know, I'd, mm -hmm. I also said, man, I wish we started earlier, <laughs> you know, but um, like when we think about those things, like one of the things I was taking into consideration is like timing. I think timing is such an underrated context for everything that we do. Like you can have a great idea, but if the timing is not right, then 
it doesn't have the same impact. So to give you an example for us personally, in 2020, we launched a new course called Productive at Home, which teaches people how to be productive working from home. Now, I've been working from home for over 10 years now, so I could have launched that course anytime, right? But guess what happened in 2020? As we all know, we all stayed at home. We all had to learn how to be productive working from home, which was a new concept for many people. And as a result, launching that course at that particular time, like we could have done it two years ago, but it would have made very little impact compared to what it does today. And timing, mm -hmm. I think, is such a big concept that anytime I'm making a decision about yes or no, I also like to think about what's the timing of this? Is this relevant today? Yeah, it, it, I think that the context of timing, and, and I think that's a great example that you gave of that course probably got like two to five times disproportionate results because of the year that we're in. And then and then just the idea of like focusing. Um, there's actually this really great question from the book, The One Thing. Just this is, I think, another note or downer. What's the one thing that I can do such that by doing that, everything else becomes um, unnecessary or easier? And I always ask myself that as like, what is the sequence of like, way to do things instead of trying to do everything together yeah so like to me another way of saying that in my own language would be what's the domino that i want to hit first because then everything else will just fall into place and oftentimes be a lot easier too right and so anytime i try to tackle a big project that's the first thing that i always try to think of because oftentimes what I see most people struggle with is just taking the first step. And if you know what the first mm -hmm. step is, especially if it's a domino move, then everything else becomes a lot easier. So it's worthwhile thinking about the domino move, as I like to call it and say, okay, let me spend like 10, 15, 30 minutes thinking about this because doing that will have disproportionate returns in terms of what mm -hmm. I actually do and focus on. Yeah. I have so many people who like will, will come to me basically with this, the statement of, I have a great podcast idea. Should I build this? Or like, how do I start a podcast, right? And after all, like like hundreds of conversations, the one thing that I've realized is like, if people just get started, everything else becomes so much easier. So I always like advise people, um, if you want to record a podcast, like especially if it's an interview show, find five people do you want to interview and then just go do the interviews however you can, whether it's your phone, whether it's like Skype or whatever, because once you've like gone over that hurdle, like picking a logo, all these are all these other things become much easier. So like, I'm curious, like for you, like, have there been things like that, that were surprising to you where doing one thing made like doing one thing or like hitting the first domino made everything easier? Oh, I mean, I see this every quarter when we launch a new project, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. um, when I think about even on a quarterly basis for a company, I don't always know what all the steps are, especially if we're tackling something new. I don't know oftentimes all the steps that are required to get it done. And I think a lot of people can relate to that when we try to do something new or trying to do something big. You know, there's a lot of advice out there of like breaking stuff down, right? Which I think is good advice. However, it's also unrealistic to say that you can do that for everything that you want to do. And so oftentimes if you have like a big project you just need to know what the first step is and just take that first step, mm -hmm. which is always the hardest step because it requires like activation energy, maybe a little bit of confidence, you know, uh, taking a leap of faith sometimes to do that. And then once you take the first step and you finish it, as long as you keep your eye on the prize, you kind of know where you're going, then the second step will become clear. And then third step will become clear. And it's not always going to be the most efficient way to getting to your goal or to your outcome. Right. Um, and I think you can only be very efficient when you know all the steps. But if you don't know all the steps, sometimes you got to do stuff that's just not efficient or is not like scalable. Right. Um, and just actually do it and just follow up with what's step number two. All right. I just did that. What's step number three? All right. Let's do that. And as you move forward, things, like you said, become more clear and you just know, like, okay, now I kind of see the path. Now I can kind of construct a path a little bit and kind of go in that direction. Yes. So many times, like we're like sitting on the couch waiting for the perfect map to drop. What we don't realize is like, we have to get started and explore the territory. And that's how we like figure out what the map is. Yeah. So one quote that I really like is, uh, you don't have to be great to start, but you have to start to be great. And I was like, yes, that is so true. Like we don't have to be the best at anything that we do to get started, but if you want to be 
the best at something, you do have to get started, right? Mm -hmm. And so anytime we're working on something or anyone that's listening, like anytime you want to do something big or tackle something that you're unfamiliar with, getting started is the hardest part. So whatever you can do to eliminate friction to get started is a win-win, right? So for example, um, if you want to work out more, like what's the first step for you to get started? And for me, oftentimes, if I don't feel like working out, the easiest thing to do is just putting on my workout clothes. If I put on my workout clothes, like everything else usually kind of falls up, falls into place, right? Now, when you add accountability on top of that, like we mentioned earlier, then the tendency for me to get started is even higher because now I know like someone is counting on me. And so now I'm like, okay, I'm intrinsically motivated to get started to <laughs> put on my workout clothes to then also to show up on time because I know someone's counting on me. Yeah, it's just like, like, I think sometimes we think like things have to be this so complicated, but if we just make it easy for ourselves, there's more likelihood of doing it. I actually, this is funny. Um, that that kettlebell thing I got for for a few days, we moved like it out inside from the balcony in in the apartment that we're living in, and I found myself doing less because of the added work of picking it up from the living room and taking to the to the balcony where I was doing them. Then I just went back and left them outside because eliminating that has made it easier for me to just get into it. Um, it. It's really weird, right? Like we're at the end, like I think that we're all just like have like these like lizard brains that don't want to do anything. And we just, we're always like tricking ourselves into like doing what's good for us. Yeah. And I think in that vein, the opposite is also true, right? If we don't want to do something or we want to break a bad habit or do something less, then the more we add friction, the less likely we will actually do it, right? So like, if we want to stop checking our phone in the morning, guess what? Put your phone in a different room. And then in order for you to check your phone in the morning, when you wake up, you now have to like get out of bed, you know, walk into a different room to grab your phone. And oftentimes that's too much friction. So you'll just like not check your phone and you just start your day, right? So like the inversion is also true. Um, so what are some other uh, rules that you have for us here? So so, so these are two questions and, and they, they came from, some came from like Tim Ferriss and some have just sort of like combined different questions. But one is this question, uh, which is whatever you're trying to do, what would it look like if it were easy? And I found personally, like there's sometimes like I'm, I'll be trying to do something and I'll make this like complicated and creative mess in my head of like 10 steps and blah, blah, blah. And, like when I look at it through the lens of this question, I realize so much of what I'm trying to do just isn't necessary. And like, what is the shortest path to do the, do that thing? Um, because it looks pretty when it's on a to-do list with like all the calendars and stuff, but I find some of them, some of that is just like not essential. Yeah. Uh, the other TF that, you know, Tim Francis uh, always says this same question to me as well, whenever we're working on stuff, you know, if we were going to do this and it were to be easy, what would it look like? And when you ask yourself that question, you come up with really creative solutions to figure out ways to make something really easy. And uh, whenever we put like a dinner party together or like a social event for our friends, um, a lot of times he'll put up that question because not because we're lazy, but we know, and this is one of my core beliefs as well, like the simpler the solution, the, the oftentimes the best solution it is. And whenever we can, let's go for simplicity. And so the simpler something we can do um, that's always the route I would always recommend that we take. And so I like that question a lot. Thank you. Um, another one is uh, the statement, don't make the tool the goal. So I think what happens is, and, and I saw this like in my sort of like work in marketing before, where a lot of times people would come in and be like, hey, we need like a Facebook campaign or a social media ad campaign or all these different things, right? And I would always ask them like, what is the objective that you're trying to get to? And the objective usually was like more sales or more customers or whatever. And um, what I asked them is like, wouldn't it be better like if you already know who the customers are, just do a cold email campaign to reach them and just email a thousand of them and see how many respond and get into conversations with them. Um, but they're like, no, but like we need a social media following and all of those different things. And I think sometimes what happens is like, especially if the tool is shiny, like making a social media following, um, we mistake that for the goal and spend our time, all our time on that instead of asking, is this like the end goal or is this just a tool that it's in service to an end goal that we're trying to achieve? Yeah. I mean, we see this in our industry a lot and, you know, some people call it productivity porn and it's just the idea of 
oh, look, there's a new app. Let me check out this new app and maybe it'll be much easier, much more efficient or shinier or it will look prettier. When if we zoom out, what we're trying to do is just actually get work done, right? Or accomplish mm -hmm. our goals. Like however we do it, however we get there, it really oftentimes makes not that big of a difference. Uh, it's not like the tool is going to magically make you, you know, achieve your goals. Uh, it can definitely help. Don't get me wrong, but it's oftentimes not the solution. Yeah. Um, if you're not even using Notion, are you being productive right now? Right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Right. Especially like Notion is like the hot thing right now. Uh, back in the day, it was like Airtable, right? Now it's like the new kid on the block is like Coda and Woven and all their you know, tools that are and out there. And then Rome and Evernote. Yeah, Rome. Like Evernote has been around, but like Rome is now a hot thing too. And it's like, I respect that the new apps are out there because they do solve certain problems for a lot of different people. But I think it's easy to lose sight of the fact that, hey, this is a new tool. Yes. Um, but let's not lose sight of the fact that we're trying to accomplish X or Y or Z, right? And let's focus on that first and foremost and see how the tools can help us or complement us in achieving those, not necessarily making that the goal, like you said. Exactly. And then, then the last one is this sort of like, this is probably the most philosophical, uh, is this idea of like the days are short, but months, years, and like decades are long. And I think there's another quote, which is like, we overestimate what we can get done in a day, but underestimate what we can get done in a year. Um, so having a long-term horizon and then just being kind to yourself. Like if you don't achieve everything that's on your to-do list every day, it's fine, move it to the next day because even if you don't get it in a day, you'll get it done in a week or whatever. And then if you just take consistent effort on like a long-term horizon of like a year or like five years, you will be productive. Mm. Yeah. And I've seen this to be true in my personal life too. Like I can maximize a day really well, but if I think about the long-term plan of what I can do in one year, I oftentimes underestimate what I can do. And that's because it's something I remind my team and people that I work with is as humans, we are not good at planning long-term. That's just, to me, that's a universal truth. As a human, we are just not really good at planning long-term. It's, it's almost like a superpower to be honest. And it's just the idea that as things are further away, it becomes more complex. And as complexity grows, it's difficult to estimate and plan for that, right? So like the analogy I always like to give when people join the company is, you know, imagine you have to build a building and it's a hundred floors and each floor on average takes like a day to build. How long would it take to build the building? And most people would say a hundred days because there are a hundred floors, right? But the reality is oftentimes you have to, you know, build the foundation. And as you each build, as you build each layer in each floor, there's more complexity of like how the water pipes will go and like what the design will look like and like what the weight you know, distribution will look like. And what about the wind and earthquake and blah, 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 blah. Right. And it's like you, complexity grows as you're growing in size and as it becomes further away from you. And so oftentimes it takes much longer than a hundred days to build that building in reality. And so I find that to be true in our, you know, in the way we approach our goals and like try to do stuff. Like that's why I'm personally, I'm a big fan of like short-term goals, like 90 mm -hmm. days or less, because we can focus intensely and accomplish something major still in 90 days, but it's not so far away that it's like for us to, uh, that it makes it easy for us to procrastinate. Yeah, we're not very good at like delayed gratification, right? And like really like understanding the the power of like compound interest, where it's like just like a little bit of improvement over a year or five years is a lot of improvement. And and we we for some reason we can't understand that. Um one thing yeah. one thing they said interesting was like the, the building example. And I think this is another sort of like philosophical thing where it's like, I realized like let's say like you have like a system, right? We and we want to add something to it. Um usually we think adding one more thing will maybe increase the complexity just like that, like by one thing, uh, like incrementally, but most of the times, like the complexity increases exponentially. So another thing I try and do is like not try and like not add new things to things unless like they're really required. Um, I think a great example is in companies, there's always sort of like a new tool and like you think you just add a new tool and, and that's it but then like that tool has to con connect through APIs with everything else you're using. And now you have like 10 more sort of like API connections that could go wrong and the complexity has just gone up exponentially. Yeah. And I, I see this 
a lot with uh, hiring, right? So like when people think about hiring people, you think about, okay, well, if I'm going to bring an additional person to do X, it's going to make everything easier and simpler. And oftentimes what you actually find in reality is when you bring someone on, um, oftentimes that's a good thing, right? But in the short term, you are actually less efficient and less productive because you have to like onboard the person, integrate that person, all the team members now, you need to get to know that person, right? They count on that person and like have to learn their personalities and how they work and integrate them. And in the short term, you actually go down in productivity and output, but then it takes a while before you get out of that dip and then things start to go up again because you added that person is now trained up and understands the culture and the values and, and so on. So it is a short-term hit in a way, but um, like I said, it also adds more complexity because now uh, you have to hold more one-on-one -on -one meetings. You have to hold bigger team meetings, right? And maybe like, let's just say uh, you had a small office that could only help hold like four people adding a fifth person, that person doesn't fit anymore. Now you have to like find another office space, right? And then you have to find like another computer and like another license that you have to buy and the expenses start to go up exponentially. And then so on. like, it adds way more complexity than just adding one person to something. Yeah, an interesting example I heard from a company was um, they were trying to like make sure like everyone could sit around like a lunch table. And then when they like added like that an extra person, they're like, oh wait, now we have to buy like more like lunch tables. And then is that person sitting alone, right? And like, like how do like how does that work? So it just always keeps increasing. Yeah, exactly. Now um, I know we're coming close to our end time here, um, but before we wrap up, you mentioned the book at the very beginning. I want to make sure we talk about this very quickly and briefly about emotional intelligence that was rocking your world. Um, and how you mentioned how like procrastination is an emotional regulation rather than a time management thing. Uh, can you like quickly speak to that? Yes. Um, I, I think for me, what I found personally, like actually this is a great example um, where I was talking with a friend last night and we were kind of like in a similar situation with a client where we hadn't sent the invoice. And um, that like became a whole discussion of like, why haven't we sent the invoice? And what we realized was what we we're dealing with is let's say like we were signed up to do X, Y, and Z for a client. And then we had a conversation about adding like ABC to it as part of the contract. And like ABC didn't really get done. So like we did X, Y, and Z, but like felt like ABC wasn't done. And we're like, Oh, should we like adjust the invoice or whatever? Did we actually deliver? Did we like not deliver? Should we charge less? Right. So the, the thing wasn't actually just send the invoice. It was all of those questions that we were asking that were in a way like a reflection of how we think about ourselves and our relationship with the client, which was a conversation because there was some like resentment involved of like, oh wait, like, but we weren't supposed to do this and like we weren't set up properly. And, and what I find most for most things that I'm like delaying on, it's usually something around that, that then is a conversation, a hard conversation with someone that I don't want to have. Yeah, I think procrastination is a symptom of a lot of different things. So like an emotional thing, like you mentioned, oftentimes it can also be masqueraded as an energy problem. So for example, uh, what I often see in a lot of people is when you're tired, it's so easy to procrastinate and to delay stuff because you just don't have the energy for it, right? And so when someone is procrastinating a lot, you kind of have to inspect and see like what what is actually the root cause of this because procrastination is just a symptom of like many different things right just like when you feel sick or you don't feel that great it could be a symptom of many different things you could have a virus right you could just didn't sleep that well uh, maybe you ate something bad right like it's just a symptom but you got to figure out what the root cause of that is and i think uh that's what one of the things that fascinates me about procrastination is just like there's just so many things that address that and that could cause it as well. So there's no one solution that kind of like fixes that. You really have to figure out what is the root cause of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes it's like, it just, it might just be that your basics are off. Like, are you drinking enough water or sleep or diet? And it, it's funny, like everything just comes back, not everything, but a lot of things just come back down to the basics. Yeah, and that's why at Asian Efficiency, every year we do a back to basic series on our blog where we just go back to the basics because like you said, it just, if you get that right, everything else will usually fall into place. And um, and again, we'll make sure to link to the book that you mentioned earlier. Can you just show it real, 
real quick again? Yeah, and I'll send you the link after too. Emotional Intelligence by Charles M. Jones. Yep. Awesome. Well, Sachit, I really enjoyed this uh, podcast episode with you here today. I really appreciate you being on. For those who want to find out more about you, what you're up to, you know, follow you, where, where can they go? Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me. We've had um, a lot of these discussions sort of like offline. So it's cool to do it here. Um, if people want to find out more, uh, my podcast is called The Conscious Creator Show. So it's at www.creators.show. Um, and then if people want to learn podcasting, I'm working with a company called OnDeck. So that's at beondeck.com slash podcasters, where we're basically creating a fellowship to inspire the next generation of podcasting talent.